exception there. Um, I've been doing security for about six, five years now, um, and done a couple of podcasts as well um, that I've been either a guest or I've been writing for them and doing research for them. So I've been across the board just all over the place, I guess. Um, so this is our, the agenda for the talk. We're going to do a RTFM on containers um, just as a precursor. Uh, just want to gauge the room here before I really go into rant mode. Um, some possible uses that I've used it for in penetration testing and also um, intelligence work um, or open source intelligence. Um, going to show you guys how to actually hack in and out of containers a little bit. And then the big thing of the intelligence portion has brought is actual botnets and also um, give a preamble on how those work with the addition of where we're at today. Because um, I originally did this talk in 2019 with the first blog post I did about it in 2018. So it's been four years now. So um, why do we need a care? These are the initial numbers from the original talk that I did showing that 25% of, of companies have adopted Docker in 2018. And you can, I find it funny that a bunch of them have abandoned them in 2018, but uh, they all came back. Uh, this number has only gone up. And what's also funny is as that number has gone up, um, as of like last week, Datadog put out another container overall. Here's what the data is on it, um, how many companies are using it. 30% of hosts um, are running unsupport, uh, unsupported container D versions, which is the basically how containers get created in the operating system. This goes across not only Docker, but Kubernetes as well. And I've got a new number that's really scary when I read that last night. Um, and there's also probably some pretty sensitive stuff on there. You've got, you know, your normal web apps. You have Redis, da databases, Elasticsearch. Sorry, I'm calling you guys out, even though you're a sponsor, apparently. Um, it's, not, it's not you that did it. It's your users. No, I'm kidding. Um, so <laughs> let's get into the RTFM. Um, who here actually has used um, Docker or knows what it is? Okay. Who's got it in production? <laughs> okay, so <laughs> what is a container? It's like a virtual machine, but it isn't. This is the um, doc or the uh, graphic that Docker put out to show us. Like, yeah, it's just the application running inside of its own thing. You don't have all that bulk. Here's how I like to think about it. It's kind of like a container is a Russian nesting doll, um, where you have uh, everything has its own defined space. It doesn't need all of the extra infrastructure like you would with virtual machines, where virtual machines usually have this big um, enterprise server, and you have everything, all the file systems divisioned out and allocated out for the rest of the uh, thing and all of that. Um, like I said, why I asked that question, where it's used is in production. Just looking at Shodan, you can find a lot of places are using Docker, and you can find out what kind of infrastructure they have just from uh, an open source perspective. So developers use it a lot, too, just to kind of, it kind of fixes the, and why I first heard about it when I was still a web developer, was we were using it at, to fix the, it worked on my machine problem. <laughs> we were also using Vagrant beforehand, but then other, computers were not uh, RAM intense as what we were using. So what it, it's great for, for what I've used it for, um, it's great for running tools. Um, I hate dependency hell. Um, so I love that it handles all the dependencies. I bake that in, and it just works most of the time. Um, segment, uh, segmented networking for reverse engineering. Um, a lot of the guys that I talked to um, when Docker first really blew up back in like 2017 that we're doing reverse engineering for ransomware and stuff like that, they were actually exploding um, the malware inside of containers because they all had virtual box or virtual or VMware flags to check if, hey, am I running in a VM? 
and then it would be like, no, you're running not in a VM. We just don't know what it, this is in the malware, at least. Um, and also development of tools for cross OS testing, um, which is great for me when I'm doing different platform shells and all that fun stuff. Um, so just a very simple example. This was my first project, and I throw this up here as a kind of tutorial. Um, this is your Docker file. It's fairly simple. So what I did is I wanted to replace my uh, Kali VM. So I made a Docker image, five lines of code. Or sorry, yeah, yeah, five lines of code, and I had top ten Kali tools. I had the Kali uh, distro running, and I also had Metasploit up and ready to go. Um, that was sixty gigs in a virtual machine, and it comes down to uh, four, or sorry, five here. So that, to me, when I was living uh, in college and I also had to redo a bunch of stuff on my machine for classes and I got it, uh, I was running out of disk space, it was great when I wanted to actually hack stuff in my free time. So what I've done in professional work is I've just kind of just picked a tool or an attack. So if I have something like uh, cert.sh where we wanted to do a bunch of different certificate intel stuff we wanted to do phishing uh, gofish did a bunch of their stuff into container infrastructure as well which we then were able to pipe into evil engine x um, and then also running c2s on infrastructure that we would have in the cloud so i could automate that and not have to worry about um, all the weird configuration dependencies i just have containers for that so let's talk about actually hacking into containers. Um, first thing we need to do, we need to get into the, onto the container. Then we're going to check privileges. And then we need to figure out a way to actually persist. You know, the typical hacker methodology, discovery, exploitation, persistence, exfil, and all that. So like I just said there. Um, there's two different ways to kind of do this. Most of the time, if you're going to be looking at getting onto a container or if you get onto a container, you're probably going to get in through a web app. 90% of what's on production environments is going to be web apps or something like that that has an external presence. So if you're doing an external web app assessment, you're going to probably run into something like that. That's the most common one. And then another thing on getting onto a container is the Docker socket. And I'll come back to that one because there's a whole slide for that. Um, if you want to look more in depth on how to uh, use these for privilege escalation, hack the box. A couple of the older machines actually have a couple of, um, you, you break in via a web app and then you have to privilege ask either through um, reverse proxying out another container's um, port or actually um, interacting with the Docker da daemon inside of the machine or inside the container. So let's say we get onto a container. What are, what's the first thing that we need to do? And the first thing is that we need to uh, check our privileges. These are the default privileges that you have in there which means every single container, no matter what configuration the developer has given it, has these set conditions. Um, so we can change the root directory from any container at the second to last one there. Um, but what's really fun is if a developer does this, which I say never do. Never do this. tac, -tac privilege and tac, tac cap at all do the exact same thing within the Docker CLI. And what that basically does is anyone see the sysadmin one there? Perform a range of system administration operations. Kind of broad, right? So that means you can mount the host file system to the container. <laughs> so this is inside of a, a Docker machine, which is now de deprecated. Um, it, it was a way to run Windows or run, run containers on Windows. It was just basically inside of a VM, and it's just a Docker container there. But if you see on that last line, it says um, containers. So if you were to find something like this, you can just then say, um, yeah, well, that's cool. 
That was actually the culmination, and I wish I put this meme in my bachelor's project, but that was actually the the big exploit in my bachelor's project was I was like, oh yeah, I just did this. That was easier than I thought, which then got me thinking again, um, and talking about that bachelor's project, this is where we I pivoted more into looking at, okay, how can this actually be used? Because if it's this easy for me to not only get onto a container, I mean, well, getting onto a container is one thing, but also just if it's this insecure to, if a developer is able to just give all permissions to this container, that doesn't bode well for the overall security of any sort of application or network that it is attached to. So what I said here at the very conclusion or whatever is I was like, eh, botnet, that probably is the best way to do it. And I hate when I'm right. I was not completely ahead of the game here. The first iteration of crypto miner, mining j docker, blah, blah, crypto jacking botnet was... Um, 2017 there's actually a github issue where you can actually f i think it's still up where you can actually find the first instance of this but this was the first article that i found after i found a couple of them in my free time um and I'm, we'll actually go through how i found them and also do some live threat hunting because it's still there um also uh, at the same time when uh right after i found all this out um, this was a very bad CVE. Basically, it was any container became a privileged container because you could just make it one and then escape it by interacting with the Docker socket. Um, like I said, Docker socket. This is the end. How am I doing on time? I actually don't have a watch on for whatever reason. So what the Docker socket basically is, is you have, let's say I have a server up in the cloud. I want to be able to run stuff on there and I'm too lazy to set up SSH keys. What this allows you to do is it allows you to run a network socket on your Amazon, your DigitalOcean or whatever. Usually it's on port 2375, port 2376. And what that allows you to do is just tell your CLI, Docker run tech host, and give it the host IP and the um, socket port that you set up, and then it runs stuff there. Yeah, so you remember this image? That is an example of all of those being able to run. So you could literally just go in and say, hey, 13.56.158.173, run my code on anywhere from anywhere and also unencrypted. So one night I'm like, this is bad. So I start looking around. I'm like, there's no way that I'm the only one seeing this. And one, okay, cool. I'm looking at a Chinese address. That's fun. Um, but I came across this one image that kept popping up here. And it's the Zulu 2 slash auto. I don't know if you guys, are, I don't know if you guys are seeing that. Okay. Um, so I was like, that doesn't look right, because at my point in time, I was like, you really shouldn't be doubling up. That looks odd. Also, it's not a known service. It seems sketchy, looks sketchy, probably sketchy. Let's go look. So Googled the username. <laughs> and someone else actually got hacked by it and put an official issue in on Docker Hubs or on Docker's GitHub, which I thought was funny. Um, so he actually had a honeypot already set up because he was like, eh, I'll just see what, what happens. Um, talked a bit in the issue, and then I was like, okay. He didn't know if what was actually running on it. And I was like, okay, cool, time to hack a hacker. Kind of. Just downloading it. So pulled down the image that was hosted on Docker Hub, and um, this is what I figured out that you can do. So if you actually look at... Um, the documentation you can change the entry point on any sort of uh, on any docker image so it may have it say in this case it was the entry point was um, bin slash bash slash entry but I was like oh okay cool so now I know what code to look at 
and then I just said, okay, cool, just pop me into a shell. Don't run what the actual code is, and then it's just all the source codes right there, which is really funny because then all of his source codes right there, and he's put it everywhere. So if we look at in cat entry, we determined, um, and it's very small text, and I apologize for that. On the very almost to the bottom, we can see that it's actually going in and mining cryptocurrency, specifically Monero, on the actual um, box. So any of the boxes that we saw, oops, wow, it just went all the way to the bottom. Hang on. And again, and again, and again. I apologize for that. I hit zero and it went, yeah, QA time. Um, where was I? Yeah, so it, we knew it was mining Monero. We wanted to figure out, okay, how is it actually working? Or I wanted to figure out how it was actually working. So there was this file called um, botnet, which I was like, great. <laughs> yeah, not, not hiding. That's cool. Tor socks. Nice. Also not hiding was um, his username and passwords for all of his show <laughs> Yeah, that was funny. <laughs> so then I contacted Shodan because these are actual, these were Shodan accounts that he was using to do the um, exact same queries that I'll show you in a bit. Um, to go through and um, just grab an entire list of them, go into them, and then say, okay, cool, now now they're mine, I'm mining Monero. So three in the morning, successfully takes down a botnet. Yay! That was a fun email to receive that I have archived that I probably should frame it at this point. Okay, so he showed up again. <laughs> so this time under the username pavlov32 slash auto. Okay, cool. So same name, image, same whatever, same key, same. Basically, it was the exact same code. Got into, got over to Shodan. He was still using. He just basically made a bunch of new Shodan accounts. He then threw it up, threw it back over to them. They took it down. It was like great. And again, this time just recreating the same username of Zulu two. So I was like, okay, this is not going good. Told. Docker told Shodan, and I was like, okay, that went down. And that time, he actually used the Pavlov32 username, so then I was like, yeah, you're the same guy, even though the code looks exactly the same, but now I can just say that it's you, so great. Kept doing it, kept doing it, and again, this time he just redid Pavlov32, which was great, same code, again. Um, actually, at one point... Um, I kept tracking him down and kept tweeting out his uh, his keys and everything and his passwords um, that he base 64'd everything. So it was 32,000 lines of a base 64 string. Yeah, like I'm not just going to pipe that into a shell, do into a base 64 decode and then whatever. Anyway, not very sophisticated. <laughs> Effective, not sophisticated. So to kind of help out, and actually what happened um, during the whole me talking back and forth with um, Shodan was they disabled the actual um, query via the website for about three months. So I couldn't see what was out there. I couldn't keep investigating or anything. So what I did is I was like, oh, okay, cool. There's an API. Well, let's just build an API thing. So then I look at the API, and I'm like, oh, yeah, oh, I can see way better now. Um, so I wrote a tool called Dalek, which was a joke among my friends because they were like, yes, you must exterminate the botnets. And I'm like, <laughs> I'm like, all right, cool. I'm not good with naming things. Um, which um, we're actually, I'm going to show that um, doing it live because, and this will get into the, the point that I want to make on why it's still an issue. So let me see if I can go in here. So I have a little shell script here that's just a bunch of the queries, and this is all on GitHub. You can play around with it. So I'll just cat this out real quick here. Um, are you guys able to see that okay, or do I need to make it bigger? In the back, all good? Sweet. Um, so I've written 
the tool so that it just takes normal Shodan queries. I mean, it passes it over to it. And um, these are the most common ports that you're going to find an open uh, Docker daemon on. Uh, so your 2375, which is the default that is set by Docker when you open up the Docker daemon socket. Uh, 2376, you have to set it, and then it gives an SSL um, tunnel to work through there. 4243 is just like the alternative for some reason that every developer just decided was okay. I don't understand where they came up with the number mm -hmm. at all. It might, it, it doesn't make sense to me, but, and then um, actually Kubernetes has um, a similar issue, um, especially ones that use the Docker um, container D socket. Um, they actually have the same problem. And also this is their open dashboard port and you can actually, if they have it configured incorrectly or just by default, it is completely open. So if you see the node is attached there, which I actually added last night, and I'll show you guys why I added it last night in a second here. So if we just run that, it looks really like stupid and hackery because I was bored and made a banner that's obnoxious and it's not gonna work. <laughs> So we'll see if the internet actually works. So it'll go down, it'll go up to Shodan and it will grab everything out and it'll actually give you a JSON file. And then I have additional parsers that actually show me the actual um, uh, contents of those files a little bit more parsed out here. So I'll make it bigger again here. By the way, this is what my life has been at night for like the last four years, late at night. My wife can attest to that, right? She just went, mm-hmm. <laughs> so this is what the tool will spit out. This is the um, docker.txt file. <laughs> She's just talking up a storm now. <laughs> I'm screwed. Um, anyway, um, this is the docker.txt file that gets generated. Um, I put it in txt because I hate reading JSON for whatever reason, when it's huge, when it's a small amount of stuff, I can work with that. But I was just like, okay, cool. So I would pull this last night. And for Friday, November 4th at 1400 UTC, or sorry, 1600 UTC, this is an actual, um, right here. No, that's not going to help. This is, this is an actual actor that I'm pretty sure has and has been correlated by other um, security companies and threat intel companies that is associated with um, it's called Kinsing I think is the D.SH or wait no is this Team 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 T no this is kin Kinsing um, this one's associated with um, Asian state actor I'm not sure which one exactly but it's either China or I think it was China that they put this one on and it's been running for four years, and all they've really done is changed up the C2 every once in a while. So wherever they're pulling down the script from, that that's the only thing that's changed. And I've also tracked all of that. And if you want to actually look at that code, um, what did I have for this? Yeah, so th that tool actually pulled down all of this last night. Um, and then at one point, um, here's the other issue that I have, or that I ran into last night. My query brought that up. If you can't tell what that number is in the back, that says that Kubernetes had 387,000 different results, roughly. With that port open, that does not mean that they were vulnerable to what is similar to the Docker socket, where you can just build a node or put a container image up there. Um, that was closer to 711, S still bad, but imagine if um, we have an event where um, someone f figures out, hey, if this port is open, we can just hit this endpoint really, really hard, and now we create containers on or nodes inside of the Kubernetes port. That's a big deal. Um, and it's also why I've kind of been tracking it for a while, um, and I've put up everything that I have ever found in um, a GitHub repository that's aptly named Docker Botnets uh, under my GitHub, and it's fully public for everyone to go and take a look at. Um, and I've found, I think, 50 unique botnets over the last four years from different 
actors. A lot of them are repeat offenders. Um, there are two right now that basically have set the precedence for what it looks like to actually have a good kill script. Because what they'll also do, they'll get onto the box. They won't just install a crypto miner anymore. They'll get onto a box. They'll kill all of their competition, which also gives you a nice detection script for all the other ones. Um, and then they'll install a crypto miner and then go find other ones and then repeat the process. So everyone had their own kill script, which was really funny. So I just thought one day it's like, if I just put everything together, allegedly all the kill scripts and just sent it to everything, this wouldn't be an issue. But that's illegal because then I would be hacking. So on something I do not own, which is bad. So I like to put um fourth this is kind of like the ranty portion of the talk um so this is more of just my opinion on where we're at in terms of crypto jacking botnets especially tied to docker and what you have now um so this meme actually came out not from a docker botnet from but from the log for j or log for shell vulnerability this was a meme that i saw and it it aptly put together what um, we as InfoSec, Threat Intel, and whatever lo are looking for. We're looking for that nice, juicy, like, RCE that we have that we can just say, okay, cool. But then everyone's like, oh, they're just installing crypto miners. Not a big deal, right? No. Because then state-sponsored people are getting a hold of it. This one's questionable. Um, honestly, if you're here for the last talk, this may just be Russia using Iran's infrastructure from that talk um but yeah it's it's a big issue not only are people either making a crap ton of money off of this but they're also causing issues like monero is almost 90 percent driven off of like crypto jacking campaigns at this point which is kind of funny mining is just all crypto jacking campaigns i doubt there's a single person that is mining that actually or a single like thousand people that isn't running on someone else's <laughs> infrastructure in a mining pool um also um conti leaks they had a exact copy of one of the campaigns that i found at one point and when the conti leaks actually i got a hold of it um there was you know they had their encryptors they had their rpc call callers that you know their their ransomware package but right next to it was two folders, and I'm like, I know both of those names. And I looked at it, and I'm like, yep, those are both crypto jacking campaigns for Kubernetes and Docker. So why they're using this is kind of a precursor to your normal attacks. So for instance, of Conti, they're using it as we need a way to generate a consistent thing of income so that we can actually expand because ransomware payments are kind of you know hit or miss so if they have a constant stream they can then keep all their servers up for zero effort all their infrastructure if they want to expand infrastructure they're going to use something like this and then it's free free money it's basically just printing money for them um so this is kind of going to be the last time i talk about this as i've been doing it for four years um, there's a lot that still can be done and it's a lot of work that I've had a lot of sleepless nights over because I've just been like looking at it, looking at it, looking at it. Um, I've written plenty of articles and I remember mentioning the Kinsing thing. That is the exact same signature from, uh, the first time I uploaded it. Um, and 36 or this is one that I uploaded uh, on October 30th, so a couple, or like last week. And it has the same infrastructure or same behavior, same whatever, um, of a crypto miner and also has some of their other stuff. And only 36, per, 36 out of 61 virus toll vendors actually do that. That is two years old and has been in the sphere for a little bit. Oh, yeah, this one also overclocks your CPU to 100%. Yeah, it's bad. Yes. 
100% CPU utilization and doesn't overclock based on the CPU architecture and the model number. Yeah, so you have ARM, so it had one for ARM, it had one for, um, for whatever reason, ARM, um, AMD and Intel, and then it would figure out what model it is and get the specs from the, uh, like what its normal clock speed was, and then just max the boost out on it. So if you get on a server infrastructure, that's um that's your AS, a, AWS bill going. Doo -doo 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 -doo. Um, fun fact: um, this vulnerability, the Docker socket thing, is how Docker tells you to set it up for remote hosts. It's in their documentation. This has been something that I've been yelling about on Twitter. I guess is what you do is you just yell on Twitter for four years. I'm like, guys, stop doing this. Don't. Um, so yeah, should you use Docker? Yeah, it's great when you're using it for the right reasons or you're using it to you know build out your development environment or you're using it um, on production. I would just put it behind a bunch of stuff and actually track what you're really doing here. Um, so yeah, tread carefully, um, there be dragons. And also there's people that are gonna be looking at that and specialize in it at this point that even ransomware actors are get, taking an interest in them and also state actors are also taking an interest in it. Um, crypto jacking is not going anywhere as I just showed you with a live kind of poll from yesterday and today. Um, it's still an ongoing thing. Um, so for me, my next steps are to continue work on it. Um, but I think I want to move away from just researching this because I've done this talk four times over the last three years. So it's it's time to move on for me on talking about it. But that's the thing. Um, I'm always available to chat about it if you guys take interest in it or have questions about it, um, either here or on um, Twitter. Feel free to DM me. I just joined the Discord as well. So uh, you guys can chat me up there. But with that, um, I got QA time set up. Yeah, it wow. attaches it to zero zero. That's crazy. Yeah, for since 2015. Oh. I have to check all my machines in my house. <laughs> <laughs> if it's internal network, it's fine. Probably, maybe, <laughs> allegedly. <laughs> all right. Uh, do you happen to know if Podman has Pod, okay. Uh, and the question was if I know if Podman's uh, affected by any of this. Isn't I haven't looked at Podman. I see it in there uh is is that running its own is it running on the os and initializing the docker pods from the, or containers from there it can I'd have to look at that, but I have seen Podman sites get taken over in the same way, so maybe. Any more? Uh, so, do you have any recommendations on resources? Because clearly, the documentation for Docker isn't the one to follow when yep. it comes to securing your container environment. Are there any like books or people that you recommend like checking out to try and like better secure? Yeah. Um, there's a few people on Twitter, um, and I am forgetting all their handles at the moment, which is terrible. Yeah, um, there's a bunch of books now that are out there. Um, scan or Moby Scan is another one where you can scan your containers to actually look at different privileges or any sort of callbacks or bad code or not bad code, dangerous code that's in there. Um, and I think there's another couple of ones now. Um, but yeah, there's also better guidelines out there now, just not from Docker themselves because whatever. <laughs> Honestly, the biggest hit, um, at one point there was a, I was pulling down about 15,000 different IP results that had open uh, sockets and had containers running on them. Um, what actually killed this, and now it's down to about, I pulled down about 1,000 to about 2,000 
um, devices, which is still bad, but it's better than 10,000, uh, was actually uh, Kubernetes saying, um, we don't want to use the Docker container D implementation anymore because of this vulnerability and they won't fix it because it's so in intertwined with how um, the that Docker runs that they don't want to fix it at this point. So that killed everything. Yep. Yeah, the presentation will be posted. Yep, it'll, um, I'll post it on uh, Twitter. It'll probably just be in a GitHub repo after once I get it up there. <laughs>